yesterday afternoon, I played a show for the first time in a long time outdoors. And I started to think, well, do I need to shave or not? And then I realized I'd be wearing a mask. You're comfortable doing it as long as it's outdoors at this point? Well, I can't say comfortable. I mean, it was uh, 105 degrees and wearing a mask, but it was outdoors on a green, uh, which was marked off into little quads for families. Uh, so everybody was separate. It's a big stage. So uh, we we decided to do it. And, and I think it was safe. And we all wore masks except the singer. It really doesn't work for a singer or a wind player. It's funny. I was watching a video a couple of days ago of the Beach Boys. And by the Beach Boys, I mean, you know, Mike Love and whoever he's currently surrounding himself with. But they were doing this big outdoor show somewhere in the country. And I just... I just remember thinking, is it that he wants to be playing music that badly again? I mean, I assume at this point he doesn't like need the money necessarily, but what what is it kind of driving somebody like Mike Love to 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 get out there on the road, you know, especially at his age? Yeah, gosh. Well, I mean, there's a lot of seem to be a lot of people who do not think that science is real. Mike Love may very well, <laughs> knowing what I know about him, fall into that category. This live show that you just played, this was songs off the new album? No, actually, I've been working with a lot of singers here in the last five years. One of them is this uh, woman named Millie McGuire. And I started working with her when she came in to learn about recording. And then I said, sing a demo for me. And she was amazing, like right off the bat, uh, kind of like a like Linda Ronstadt or something, or Petula Clark, maybe. She was just a totally uh, hit-making machine vocalist, great singer, um, and not affected and melismatic. And um, so I've made a record with her that is just now coming out. And um, she's 20 now, but she's about to go back to Nashville to go to school. So we thought we'd take a chance of playing a show. It's hard to release a record these days. I mean... Um, it's certainly hard to promote it, and I'm, I'm hoping that by spring of next year, it'll be better. So you did the the benefit record with Peter, and... Now, that record was already pretty much done. What I had to do was mix, mix it. That was a record we never, uh, we made kind of casually and never got around to finishing, and um, Cheryl at Omnivore was trying to do things supportive of the Music Here's COVID-19 Relief Fund, the, the Grammy Association Fund, and uh, she asked for a track, and Peter realized, Peter and I realized we had the whole album. The process of actually, again, releasing something <laughs> during a pandemic. How are you writing yourself for that, and, and, and what's your sense of how this upcoming record is going to be different because of the, the context in which it's being released? I mean, the recording of it changed. I had thought that once I'd written the uh, charts, once I'd written the melody sheets, we would all, all, a bunch of us would get in a room and perform the songs and that wasn't possible. But um, so it ended up being layered kind of like you do a pop record for the most part. Um, I'd done some performances, we captured some things before March, but um, I love the way, I mean, I, whatever happened, yeah, you know, it's records are like life. You, you start out thinking one thing's going to happen and then you kind of want to go with it. And I, I love the way this record came out. I've never made a record of my own that I've played as much already. I, I usually make them and never play them again. And I, I uh, feel disappointed on an evening when I haven't heard it. I, I, I feel like it's a very comforting kind of record, but I also like remembering how everybody chimed in. I mean, um, really, you know, going on Amazon, buying a microphone, figuring out how to record, I would coax them over, um, uh, email or a phone about where to position it and we would talk through the parts now there are, anyone who's a musician working in these times does some of this regularly they're players i often do remote things with but um for these folks it was for many of them it was a brand new experience and uh, i'm very grateful that they were willing to go the distance on it because in a lot of respects, it's an album that's very firmly rooted in jazz and a lot of jazz traditions. But it's not actually a jazz record in that we didn't all sit in the room and play. I, I, I think it, I mean, Herbie Hancock has made records like this. Certainly Joni Mitchell has. I mean, the, um, the, it, it uses the harmonic vocabulary of jazz. I mean, the chords are... And the changes or 
similar to that. But, it, you know, that's also something that Jazz uh, from this period shared with um, WC and Ravel. The, the French Impressionists were also using a similar vocabulary. I, you know, the stories of Charlie Parker being at the Baroness's house, playing along with Firebird Suite and Rite of Spring. And, um, you know, Bill Evans, you've got to hear a lot of Debussy and those voices. So I, that was a connection for me. It sounds like you feel that having that kind of in-room experience is a necessary part for describing something as being a jazz record. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, it, it is somewhat at the core of a jazz record. Uh, however, this does share that flavor in many ways. I mean, the the wind, winds players were often playing over uh, a piano track I'd already done, but they were hearing the music for the first time and responding in real time. Um, th there's, there's a lot of freedom in the expression. It just wasn't simultaneous. Do you get a sense that this might have some sort of impact on how you record in the future? Obviously you lose something by, as I'm speaking to you over Zoom, I'm telling you that you lose something by not being in the room with someone, but clearly there is a, a convenience to it. I mean, ever since the multi-track tape recorder came into being, um, it's been harder to make good records, but there is a lot of control you gain. I, I, I don't know. I, I think you just have to keep your eyes peeled and keep um, pushing the project to where it feels true. Um, you know, it, these discussions about uh, theater versus movies, um, in, in, in all cases, I think the artist wants to make the lights go off in, in your brain, or wants to make something happen. And when I'm trying to create something, I have that goal in mind and I just, try to keep chipping away at the big block of stone until what's left is what was supposed to be there. You said that multi-track recording in a sense has made it, I guess, more difficult, which is surprising to hear because obviously it's just, it's another tool that you have in your arsenal. Well, I mean, I, I think that when the tools change, there's always a time where things go to hell for a while. It, it's hard to think that records really started sounding better when the four track came into being um, the three track was a pretty good thing because you could record everything was done, one pass, everybody playing together. And then you've got a track left over for the vocal because uh, the voice box is a very temperamental instrument. But, you know, eight track, 16 track, um, most cases, you know, people would put a mic on the hi-hat and make it loud in the mix and the phase would be flipped and everything would sound <laughs> bad, you know. And then they kind of figured it out and records got to sound really good. Um, when digital came along, uh, there were the same kind of problems. Uh, you know, it was, oh, fantastic. We can cut out the guitar hum. <laughs> you know, these things that, um, and then gradually people adjusted to the digital realm and things started to sound fantastic again, but in a different way. Um, so I don't think technology is the enemy, but I do think that um, the, recording industry staggers on under each innovation for a while and then it kind of levels out and maybe for the better. Do you get a sense though that moving forward this is going to be a tool that you have in your arsenal from the standpoint again of you know I assume that one of the most difficult things about recording a record is just getting everyone in the same room at the same time. I'm never going to want to do things remotely if I have the choice of having people come in. Uh, humans communicate in all these different ways and it's just faster and better and also like you know i write a lot of string arrangements but being able to have people in the chairs and hearing it and then saying okay change the articulation here or make that a dotted quarter um right on the spot is so much better than having to go back and edit it in the computer so no i i mean but it, you know on the flip side i was i made a record called euphoria for yep rock and I asked Pat Sansone in Nashville if he would sing a harmony. And one afternoon he did like 12 part vocal orchestration that blew my mind. I never would have come up with it. He's able to work alone and he finds something inspiring. And just, I open up my uh, inbox and there's this little miracle. Have you been a lifelong jazz fan? No, 
um, I think I've been a lifelong music fan. Um, and, and I think it's true of a, a lot of, I don't know that Bo Diddley was going back in the dressing room and listening to Chopin, but I do think that most musicians listen to all kinds of music. For me, I, I was a bassist in high school. And so Charles Mingus was huge. You know, I would uh, see Ron Carter play. Um, you know, I was kind of focused on that part. And then when I uh, started playing with Alex Chilton, his family had been jazz fans and we went, we would go see Mingus or he told me about Chet Baker and we'd have discussions about that. And, you know, I've done, I mean, I've recorded with Carla Blay and uh, I, I mean, lots of people in the orbit of the Golden Palominos. The Kronos Quartet played on the some of the big star stuff. Right. No, I got them to do that. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Eighth Blackbird in Chicago, a fantastic group. Um, I mean, but this was much later. Um, I mean, I played the Montreux Jazz Festival. Uh, so, I mean, I've done things, but, you know, I'm a, I'm not a particularly schooled guitarist. Um, and uh, I'm, I write on piano these days. I've come to these jazz harmonies really just wanting to expand my options and, and to, I'm curious about it. It's been really a fascinating and creatively invigorating thing to explore. There's a story that you tell, I don't know if story is the right word, but when, when the New Songs for the 20th Century album was released, you, you know, you talked about getting this piano with all of the sheet music and how that led to those two records. But you, around that time period, around 2015, had you hit a wall or, you know, were you actively attempting to, to take your career in a new, new direction or try something else? Oh, I'm probably the last person to know what's meant by career. I, I mean, I, I uh, you know, I started writing music when I was about five, just putting notes together and um, just have continued liking that process. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think I really hit a wall at any point. I, I'm of the opinion that, a lot of people who write music kind of go into a particular frame of mind writing it. And then when they come back into the everyday world, they make up stuff about what they were doing and they don't even really remember it or they're not quite privy to what happened during that experience. But this is not to say that you can't get a commission and sit down and knock it out. But the music I've written that is dear to me usually seems to be something that's kind of in the back of my mind for a couple of days and then a certain moment comes and I write it very quickly and then I'm kind of shocked by it. Um, it, it has been better writing on paper rather than on tape recorders um, recently because um, I've gotten a little better at notating and I, I can get it more concisely, I think. How did that piano come into your life? Oh, um, I inherited it after my dad died. And it, but it was not only a piano, it was a big collection of mid-century, of 20th century songbooks, sheet music, you know, all the, I mean, Gershwin, Cole Porter, um, I mean, everyone really. It was this reminder of this music that maybe you had grown up with that had been in the back of your head that, her, that had perhaps played a, a formative role in your early years? It, it, it was indeed, but I, but I think that the, the Great American Songbook tradition it, you know, it was also something that Paul McCartney took from his dad. And, and those, uh, I, I remember when I was growing up and um, some Beatles record came out and we were not really Beatle heads in junior high, you know, but I remember Mitch Easter saying to me, oh, look, you can tell what they're doing. Every time they learn a new chord, they write a new song around it. And I think you can kind of chart the harmonic uh, evolution of the Beatles songwriting um, as McCartney pulled out these 13th chords or, um, I mean, you can tell Jimi Hendrix came to town and played the Marquee Club and all of a sudden um, Abbey Road has a couple of uh, sharp nine chords, seventh chords. And um, it, if you look at it from that uh, musicologist um, point of view, you can actually see that the that standards were a big part of that kind of songwriting. Paul is very much a music hall guy. Like, it's very clear in a lot of his songs. Right, but I mean, it's, you know, they're augmented chords right away. Um, and, and you can tell that, that this was, I mean, 
there's a bigger chord vocabulary, maybe. I mean, there's a story that McCartney tells of getting a Joan Baez record, which had a, uh, the five chord was minor. It was going from uh, a, a D to an A minor in the key of D. And this was like a revelation to them. And they immediately went and wrote a song that had that, that change in it. And, and that's something that I've always admired and uh, just like a restlessness or in, in music, you know. You, I, I think there have been times when I've been caught up in producing records for other people or just working in the studio and, and I haven't really thought about becoming a better musician, but I am thinking about it a lot now. Did you actually learn new chords in the process of, of playing the sheet music? Yes. I mean, I, I, knew, I knew classical music theory. I'd never really learned jazz music theory, and it, it is pretty different. It's a different way of thinking. At what point does this turn into a, a really feasible project for you? You know, there, there has to be a, a point when, when you go from sitting down at the piano and kind of playing around with some stuff and realizing that maybe you do have the foundation for a new project. This record, uh, which is called a, a, a Brand New Shade of Blue, is full of compositions taken from a songbook I wrote last winter, um, or in, in November and December mainly, mainly November of uh, 2019. And I call that songbook also a brand new shade of blue. So what I did was um, I, I picked up the pieces of paper and put them in a folder and I thought, I'm done, this is the work. And that is the way I think about it to be able to record this, have my friends play these songs and record them and shape them into this new release is a gift, you know, but I, I definitely thought of it as a songbook to begin with. Um, and it's a little difficult to make this claim because it, I took it to the university print shop here and then the university shut down. So no one actually has the songbook. Didn't Spy in the House of Loud start as a songbook as well, in a sense? Well, yeah, that, 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 um, I had to split it out. The publisher said, you know, you put this in front of the bookstore and people see sheet music and they run. You might as well be putting it in Morse code. I might as well have published it in Morse code. So I separated that out. Yes, that book was, originally I was doing um, a songbook of my older songs and writing down a little, a couple of paragraphs at the beginning of each um, in hopes that it would, um, be of interest. And then it just, I kept see, waking up in the morning and writing more and more and it kind of pushed the songbook part of it out. And then, then the, that songbook did become what was called uh, new songs for the 20th century. I hope your listeners can make sense of what I'm saying here. That experience, the, the, specifically the experience of writing Spy in the House of Loud, which is, you know, a collection of, of essays or, you know, stories from your kind of your early days traveling to New York and, and, playing with Big Star and, and starting these bands. Spending that much time in the past and kind of revisiting some of these stories, does that have an impact on the way you address music now? I, I think it was a lark. I, I, I don't know if it did. It was just so much fun to write that book. I, 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 don't, I don't think it was particularly, had much to do with how I'm writing now. I mean, it was fun to be able to do it. I mean, I'd probably do it differently. I'd have shorter sentences if I wrote that book again. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? I, I think they were... It was a little bit too much like I actually think and, and not, it, I, I, you know, I, I never had any English classes uh, in college or I never, or journalism, you know, I'm extremely unskilled, which made it so much fun to write that book. But do you enjoy being out of your comfort zone to some degree when it comes to, you know, either writing or creating music? I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, um, Part of the reason why I ask is because there is... You know, there, there's this book you said you, you didn't really study English and, you know, obviously you were kind of teaching yourself this version of memoir writing as you're going. And then there's this idea of, you know, having this, this you know, this long music career, but really trying jazz music and the great American songbook in earnest, which, you know, I think like takes some, takes some chutzpah to, to kind of put yourself out there and try this well-established music for the first time. Uh, no, I think totally. I, I was thinking about uh, only wearing T-shirts that said "Kick Me Hard" on the back, you know. Um, <laughs> but what can you do? I, I was drawn to those songs. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. What's it like playing with 
jazz musicians as a rock guy as a power pop and indie guy and is is it intimidating to to be sort of the band leader in that situation well i, I know with the drummers it was shocking at first um I would think maybe they were just unhappy because they weren't playing backbeats. You know, I'm, I got very used to that big old snare on two and four. And, you know, instead, sometimes there's a hi-hat kind of tipping, making a little quacking, tiny quacking noise. But once I got, and, and you know, and the kick drum no longer is trying to match up with a heart rhythm, but instead it's dropping a bomb. Um, and, and then I kind of got there and realized how, perfect that was and and now uh you know i played yesterday with a, a great drummer we were playing rock stop and he's hitting that big two and four on the snare and it it sounded odd to me yeah there are definitely changes in the language uh, but you know I, I was talking to somebody yesterday about what i hear in a love supreme is the same kind of thing i hear in the first television record you know it's a there's a searching quality um and Maybe maybe it is a dissatisfaction with with what's comfortable, but I, I think that a lot of the art of any in any medium that I uh, revere tends to take you out of the the everyday and be have a sense of transcendentalism or transportation, and uh, so mostly the jazz I am drawn to has that quality. That's really different than the standards. I mean, the standards, that, that's a different kind of craft. But if you're talking about actual jazz, um, the, the things where it sounds like you're trying to play a video game and, and shoot down all the monsters jumping out of the crypt, that kind of jazz playing, I'm not quite as fond of. Television is really interesting. Uh, obviously, they play a very central role in the book. And, and obviously, they're not you know a jazz band by any kind of traditional measure. But I tend to group them with, maybe the Minutemen as being the two kind of exemplars of these these punk or punk adjacent bands that really kind of did something in that jazz tradition. Is that is that what drew you to them? That this sort of idea of of exploring or transcendence? I don't know. I mean I know that uh, Tom Verlaine was a saxophone player, I think, and a fa fan of Albert Ayler before he played guitar. Um, I, and I know that they originally were trying to tell Electra for that first record they wanted to go record with uh, Rudy Van Gelder over in Palisades. Um, so th that was part of it, you know, um, all, always with that band. I actually don't know the Minutemen very well, so I can't talk about that part. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think I was, there, were, there were musical things that I'd been really into the uh, Black Angels by George Crumb and some of the other George Crumb things. Um, you know, things in the acad world of academia that I heard in the early television shows I saw. And I, I really found common ground with that. Um, the uh, punk side of it, you know, you know, being angry at your parents or whatever wasn't really a part of that for me. If you look, if you look at, I mean, there, there's a, you know, uh, lyrically there maybe was a connection with the, uh, the French uh, symbolist. I mean, the, uh, with Nerval and I guess Rambeau in, in some of the lyric writing. And that was also attractive. Um, you know, there would be lines that would seem like they were using ordinary language to say something that was not ordinary. And this is different than what the Dead Boys or, or the Ramones were doing and different than what David Byrne was doing too. Do you feel that you were able to attain some of that sense of exploration on this record? I mean, obviously like, you know, these are, it, it's not standards in the style of the new songs for the 20th century, but th these are these are pretty tight songs and, and it's clear that these are pretty self-contained. Were, were you able to sort of channel some of that jazz exploration on here? Well, it was harder because we could, you know, there was a plague. We just couldn't get in the same room together. Um, I mean, having said that, I, I love the way it came out, but um, I mean, I, I like Elijah Freeman on tenor, um, this kid, I don't know if he, I think he worked at Wendy's for a couple of years in order to get a saxophone when he was 14 and 
he's taught himself to play and really has no holes barred. And, and every time he played on anything here, um, it was very free and very expressive and, and very surprising. Um, you know, so I was really knocked out by everything he did. And, and Will Campbell, the same way. Will has a, um, a, a deeper CV. I mean, he was uh, lead alto with Harry Connick for a long time. And he's from uh, North Texas. Uh, you know, he's a very skilled musician, but he also has that ability to just breathe and be free and catch the wind with his playing and particularly rhythmically. Um, both those two um, had that, uh, you know, dancing on the head of a pin quality that you could say that was also true of the, the television playing, you know, and so I, I think there is great free freedom on this record. I, um, even if it's not exactly as I had thought, you know, the, the, with jazz players, they, they take uh, standards as a, as a highway, you know, and, and drive the way they want. And the fact that I wrote these songs that were still being treated in that way somewhat. I mean, some of these are 10 Pan Alley songs. They don't quite fit in with anything I'm blabbering on about here. I mean, um, Come Home to Me is very Tin Pan Alley, as is uh, Bangling Cheek to Cheek. And um, uh, there's a song called uh, um, It Must Be Raining Somewhere that is kind of like uh, Harold Arlen, you know, a different kind of a uh, little later Tin Pan Alley kind of writing. I mean, the thing that's funny about this record is it's actually, I recorded all the songs on the new songbook and we cut out there's another like maybe six songs that were not included here because it was just too much. And I liked the idea of having this more consistently late night mood, moody record. It feels like a very New York record to me. You know, maybe it's because again, I was reading your book at the same time as listening to it, but there, there is a sense of, of New York during the, during the quiet hours of night that I think is pretty pervasive throughout. Yeah. You know, somebody was asking me about that the other day and, and uh, I mean, I, I do like Frank Morgan uh, and, and I do like some of the West Coast stuff. I just don't know it very well. Um, but, you know, I, and I, I shouldn't tell this. I have already told it before. Um, you know, we're here sheltering still pretty much, my wife and I and our cats and dogs. And um, like everybody else, we were binging and I started watching those Bosch television programs and He's this detective who's in L.A. Uh, with a house that looks over the lights of Los Angeles. And he's got, I think, the OMF old hi-fi speakers. And he puts on Art Pepper late at night and looks out over the city and tries to forget his sorrows. And I started to think, well, I'll mix the record so it would sound good in that room. So I, I hear you about the New York side, but I think that in the end, I was kind of thinking of the gloom of and beauty of Los Angeles. Do you get the sense that next time you're able to sit in a room with people and play music that you're going to be able to, or that you'll be interested in going further down that road of, of exploration? Is this, you know, is this the direction that you're going in musically? I wish I knew. I mean, the very last thing I recorded for this record um, was, uh, it's called Un Ultra Temp. Um, I'm, or however you would say that correctly in French. Um, and, and it's an instrumental that um, I'm particularly pleased with. It's mostly just piano and soprano sax. Um, and and I, I'm interested in the way it sounds, sound, which is probably more, which is drawing me toward uh, string quartet writing. When, when you're writing something, you know, in, in this kind of, in this pre-existing and, and well-established genre, are you, are cliches something that you're thinking about and actively trying to avoid? Yeah, I'm trying to answer questions like that honestly. And the, and the honest answer is I'm not really thinking. I, I'm just, you know, it's kind of a fugue. Uh, um, it's, you know, you know, I, I like this book, uh, Betty Edwards Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, and she has an example in there and I think she even has a photograph of, uh, you know, a, a kid's at the beach and you're, and there's a 
colored shell and and then there's another one and then over here there's uh, a little piece of seaweed and you start arranging those and then you look at them and oh I'll move this one around you know it's a, a non-judgmental kind of it, it's fun um, or, or you know it has to do with being curious it doesn't really have to do with thinking about career or uh, very much planning when when you're writing music. And, and I think that what I'm saying is something that, you know, John Prine would have recognized or, uh, I mean, all, all across the musical spectrum, it doesn't have to be jazz or classical. Now, if I had just had a million selling record, would I be thinking about following that up with another one? I might. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it sounds like a good place to be as a writer or as a songwriter to just have it you know, I guess in a sense, flow through you relatively effortlessly. I mean, that's something that people constantly bang their heads against the wall to try to get to. Well, I mean, the title song, uh, A Brand New Shade of Blue, I just kept banging my head. I mean, I, I, I'm i pleased I didn't end up in the hospital. I kept trying to write that one. I had the idea for it or the, the cloud of it, and I kept trying these different ways, and I, I, I was... Um, trying to use these chordal harmonies and then I thought well I would try to do a tone row with it and I kept everything I tried just seemed terrible <laughs> and I usually don't get stuck like that so much and uh, it was frustrating but w really that's the story of all these songs because I kept approaching it and I'd lose track and then I'd say well I'm here and I'll I would write something else so I managed to write all these songs at the same time of being very frustrated about not being able to write the one song I wanted to write. And after giving up on that, it one night I did kind of find what I think is the right way to express that thing. I think this description came from you, but you know, perhaps this was in the press material, but there was a reference to Coltrane on the title track. Is, is, is that a reference to writing in those chordal harmonies that you mentioned? I talked to Will Campbell before he played the alto part on that track. And, and I did talk about those kind of pentatonic modal, uh, that kind of playing. And I think he did run with it. And I do think he sounds a little bit like he's heard John Coltrane before. One would hope. Yeah. I think it was what Will brought to that more than anything I wrote into it. But, you know, there, uh, uh, there are some, uh, the, the the final cadential chords are kind of Coltrane like. There's a uh, an E flat chord with a D in the bass that is maybe like that. Um, I think it, it, the way it was arranged does have that kind of uh, freedom. I mean, the thing about the Coltrane, you know, Love Supreme. Kind of records. I mean, it was it was moving toward an or orchestral way of thinking. You know, there's timpani. Um, it's uh, again, it's all it's all kind of a mixed bag. This is a to total aside, but uh, have you read the book as serious as your life? I don't think so. I highly recommend it, um, and I just say it's because I I read it I read it recently, and it's one of the things that like was able to kind of get me out of my funk of the last few months. It was written in the '70s, and it's really it's written about. Um, the free jazz movement, so like Albert Eiler and all these people. But one of the things that she she talks about in it is, you know, because they were playing jazz music after jazz music had peaked, and because, and honestly, even more than that, because they were black artists, which made them marginalized, is part of the reason why a lot of them weren't able to kind of go all the way with the, the orchestral music that they were were seeking out because, you know, the record labels weren't taking them seriously as classical artists. Right. There's a lot of free, freedom in the underbelly. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, for you to say, I forgot completely that, you know, the, actually on that, that first track of mine to be egotistical here and bring it back to that record, uh, the, the bass clarinet lines really were thinking of something that Eric Dolphy would have done. Um, and, and Eric was, a very skilled player who was kind of a bridge into the free thing. You know, he would play a, a very lyrical, complicated phrase and then squawk like a bird. And I mean, I love Eric Dolphy. Um, 
I don't know why, even in my high school rock band days, uh, his playing, well, with Mingus was the gateway, I guess. Um, you know, the, the whole Albert Ayler thing, I mean, that's a very New York side of it um, that, you know, we loved. I mean, um, I, I made a, a record with a street musician here named Randy Pelosi, who's a free player like that, that came out about 20 years ago that I, I should put up online. I think I have the rights to it. Um, but yeah, um, it's free jazz turned out to be kind of like surrealist classical music. It made a lot of people run for the hills. Um, so it, it didn't really, you know, but I, you know, I can listen to Albert Ayler all day. You know, at this point, is there, is there a single aspect of the, the, the process of making music either, you know, in front or, of, or behind the microphone that is the most satisfying to you? I don't really consider myself a musician because I, I don't practice. Um, but I... <laughs> Says the guy who's starting to play jazz music. I, well, I don't really play it so much. I mean, I can kind of play it on guitar, but I don't play well over changes. I don't sight read well at all. Um, but I, I do really like being in a room and something happens, of air is electric, and some great player does something I'd never expect. Or, you know, a singer, I mean, I used to record Ryan Adams all the time. We did a lot of recording here. You did the Whiskey Town stuff. Yeah, and, and after, too, you know, I mean, uh, he records a lot. A lot of my stuff has never come out um, that I've done with him, and a lot of it has, but um, sometimes I would just, push record and he would just be amazingly good um he would sing great or he would just play great it would seem like the world had changed for a moment i mean i really love that i um you know i did i did uh a show in december with a pianist named ariel pocock and um just hearing what she would bring out of a piano was astounding to me so I, uh, being able to be in the room with great players, I think, is what I like the most. But it's also pretty, pretty cool to be able to write a song. You know, I'm, that's a gift. It sounds like, you know, part of your job is kind of knowing what your limitations are. You know, I say that because, like, obviously you've been singing on records for a, for a very long time, but for these records, you're not, you're not singing them. You know, you've, you've let somebody else take the honors. Well, I'm, I mean, I was hoping I was writing songs that could be done by other people. And I, I thought maybe the best way to do that would be to actually have the other people do them, you know? Uh, and, and, and in a way, I think I've, I've done a lot of projects where, I, you know, like I wrote the script, I was a director, and I was the lead actor. I think I've done a lot of things where I, I would be the playing a lot of roles and, and singing my own songs. And, and, and I started to think, well, if these scripts, meaning these song sheets, are actually good enough, I should be able to put them in front of other, other people and they just work. And in fact, um, right after I'd written this songbook, I had to do a show in uh, Memphis and we did just that, basically put the music in front of the players and it all worked and that encouraged me to go ahead and do the record this way. I mean, some you know, I think Brett Harris is a great singer. Um, very happy to have him do most all of this because on the previous release, it jumped around a lot, and I thought that was hard to take in in one sitting. Um, and I thought he was just the right voice. Um, and uh, Ramune um, is this young woman from Lithuania who was singing at the university, and gosh, I lucked out with that song. Uh, I don't think of you, you know. I, it, she's the perfect voice for it. I could never have done that. 